Um, I'm here uh, because Professor Sean Jackson is no longer with us. He would have been the, the guy to introduce Mark Dirks. Um, he, you know, he, um, he lost his life in an accident less than a year ago. And um, he, he was a good friend of, of Mark. But I'm so happy to introduce uh, this extraordinary um, individual um, in industrial design. It is, it is a very long, um, it would be a very long introduction if I had to list all his accomplishments. But he is the uh, managing director of Lunar, a design consultancy firm in Chicago. He's also an adjunct professor at Northwestern. He has taught at Rhode Island School of Design. He has taught here and there and everywhere. He's been in every important publication um, you could list, uh, magazines or newspapers. Um, he's been a leading figure in IDSA, both locally and nationally. And he has uh, led conferences and discussions. He's active in helping the design society de redefine themselves. Um, he's a critical thinker. He's an educator. He has more than 100 patents, which is a measure in itself. I asked um, my colleague, um, Emeritus Professor Alan Samuels, to give me some juicy stories about Mark. When he was a student here, he graduated in 81. Now, where is that? Yeah, well, it's coming. <laughs> and some of the stories um, probably shouldn't be um, announced from stage. But Alan said, um, well, there was this German girl. Right. And let's leave it at that. And then he also said, I remember one thing very distinctly about Mark Dursk. He was always late for class, <laughs> but not tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mark Dursk. He left. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for the uh, note about the German girl. My wife's in the audience tonight. <laughs> um, now, you know, what a thrill, really, to be back here. Um, and uh, n I remember when I was you. Actually, I'm not sure if anybody's in the cheap seats, but I used to usher for UAC. So I used to come into an auditorium like this and sit up there and they'd uh, lock the doors and I'd watch a sound check. And then today, I got to come here and do a sound check. And it was just a real thrill to be back and to have that circle, that experience um, close. I want to thank the Stamps School of Art and Design and uh, Guna uh, for having me here to come talk. And of course, Sean Jackson, uh, who we, uh, all miss, I know, and I miss um, terribly as well. But I've got a lot of things to talk with you about, so I want to get right into those. Um, the first thing is the why. The why, uh, I became an industrial designer. And maybe a little bit about the why all of you as creative people are doing what it is you're going to do. Um, the why is the most important thing. I'm with a company called uh, Lunar, and we do a lot of amazing creative work these days. And in the end of this talk, I'll, I'll show you some of that work. But it's going to take a little bit to get there. I want to I focus on the why for a minute. I was one of the lucky um, folks who knew they wanted to be a designer before they came to college. Now, I have a blog that I write for Fast Company Magazine. It's called Design Finds You doesn't happen to everyone. Sometimes it's walking through the school when painting or sculpture or design finds you. 
Uh, but for me, it was always industrial design. It's always what I wanted to do. So I started here, and I, I learned how to become a designer here at the University of Michigan. And then I went off, and I started designing products. And I designed a lot of products. Uh, thanks, Jan, for pointing out 100 patents. It's actually gone past that now. But I had an inkling of the why when I was here. I got a better inkling of the why about eight or nine years ago. I was on my way to a very important meeting. And um, I was headed to O'Hare, and I was getting into a taxi. And as I was getting into uh, the taxi, my um, seven-year-old daughter, Monroe, came running out to say goodbye to me. And she was very, very excited. And I was um, going to this very important meeting. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And I was very uh, confident in that moment. I was uh, vice president of one of the uh, known industrial design firms. I was uh, making my clients happy. I was doing a lot of great design work, I thought. Um, and Monroe came up to the taxi cab. And she handed me a piece of paper. And she said, Daddy, I drew this for you. Well, now I was really full of myself. I thought, oh my god, Mark, you got it going on. You got the clients, you got the boss, you got everybody happy. Till I saw the picture. OK, this is Elizabeth, right? She's the tall princess with the crown and the purse. And I'm this goofy little guy in the back here. Looks like I got hit by a truck or something. I got knickers on. You guys are mostly artists. You know that a kid at seven has no perspective. This is a flat plane, right? I'm on the airplane, I'm looking at this drawing, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, what a favor she just did me. I really understand. I really understand now. She, she drew it out. She made me come to a realization of what, at that point in her life, her need was. You know, Picasso once said that all children are born artists. The problem is how to remain an artist as we grow up. And in design, this is so very, 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 very true. We um, get full of ourselves. We listen to research. We look at pages of PowerPoints that are delivered in dry tones. And we're influenced by those in, in well, at least I am in the business that I work in. Here at school, uh, not so much. You have the ability to do things um, that come from your heart. And the ability to see as a child, the ability to understand need from that perspective, is probably the most important thing that you can keep as you learn your lessons. There's a fellow at Harvard. His name is Zaltman. He wrote a book called How Customers Think. It's an amazing uh, book. He actually says that 90% of why we buy and use the products that we use is due to unconscious pr process, not rational thought. It's something that's motivating you from inside. It's a need that you probably can't articulate. It's a need that a designer needs to find and understand. Charles Eames, one of the very best designers ever, one of the acknowledged uh, geniuses in design of the last century, once said, that recognizing the need is the primary condition for design. The need is usually the why. You know, I was asked by a, a fellow, Bob uh, Nelson. He was president of a division of, of General Mills. He says to me, um, Mark, come in. I want you to redesign YoPlay for us. Now, show of hands, how many of you have tried YoPlay? All right, pretty much the whole place. OK, so at the center of what's called the brand key for YoPlay is the word joy. So Bob comes in and he says, Mark, so excited that you're here. 
I've heard great things. I want you to do this work for us. Here's one thing. Don't change the shape. Do whatever you want. Be as creative as possible, but don't change the shape. I'm like, hmm, this is going to be interesting. So the first thing we do is we go out and we actually talk to people who use YoPlay. And I want you to, I'm going to play a small video clip, and I want you to just see what, what this woman is about. We use, you know what? This is something that we always use plastic with because it's soft for our waste stuff, so. Okay. So. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Did you get that? I mean, call me crazy. I don't think food should spit at you. We met another woman, and uh, actually, I brought that clip as well. I like the wider mouth. How come? Because it's more like a bowl, a dish. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You don't feel like you're uh, like an anteater. That sounds terrible. This is, so the small arm. The small, sense. yeah. I guess I'm claustrophobic and it carries over to food now. I don't know. It just like seems, an ant eater. Well, you know, they have the tongue that goes down in the hole to get oh, the ant. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, that yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, it's when it's an, a bigger opening, you feel free. It's more welcoming, I think. Okay, so now I know a little bit more about the need. Now I know a little bit more about uh, why it's important to redesign YoPlay. And it has everything to do with changing the shape. So I'm kind of stuck. I'm like, Bob told me I couldn't do that. So I was trying to think, what should I do? What should I do? So I put together a graphic. You know, I'm privileged right now to work with one of the world's uh, most successful durable goods company, companies, and they are involved in the idea of making water clean. And we're working really, really hard on about an eight-month program to make water clean to within a part per billion, 99.999% clean, so that in places like China and India, and in fact, all the BRIC nations, we can we can enable people to drink water from the tap with this product. I'm also privileged to work on another program whose sole objective is making air clean so people can breathe. And there are places around this world where you can see the air. And it's a big part of what the why is. Sometimes people say, Mark, of all the things you've worked on, what's the most important? I usually point at this. You know, the first camera that you buy, single-use camera, I did this work in 94. It's about over. We don't use these kind of cameras anymore. We use iPhones. They're camera-enabled. But from 94 till right now, they made three billion with a B of these cameras. But what most people don't know is that this camera after you take the pictures, is returned to Kodak. The taking lens, the capacitor, the flash, a, a couple of the boards, they're stamped and reused 12 times. And then all that plastic, which is a kind of plastic called polycarbonate, including the label, and we worked hard to get that label to wrap around, that's all thrown into a grinder, and 10% of virgin resin is made, and the next camera is made from the last one. So sometimes, and I'm going to show you some amazing aesthetics and some uh, products that excel in that uh, regard. But sometimes the one I'm most proud of is the one that didn't wind up in a landfill because it speaks to the why in a meaningful way. I came here to be a designer. I learned how to be a designer, and I had an inkling that this was my why. But I am, I am absolutely sure of it now. The reason we do what we do is to leave a footprint to change, and to change for the better. If you're an artist, if you're a designer, if you deal in 
creative thinking as your medium, you have that ability. It's the most fantastic thing in the world. I'm going to talk to you next about the piece that comes after you figure that out. And by the way, if some of you figured that out now, congratulations. I guess I'm a slow study. It took me a little bit longer to get there. The next piece is the how. And for that, I have uh, a great debt of gratitude to the University of Michigan and to the Stamps uh, School of Art and Design and the professors who I met here who uh, gave me a leg up on that. I reminded of Richard Sears, who I had a life drawing class with, taught me how to see in a, in a really meaningful way. Alfredo Montavo, who was tough as nails and worked on me for my craft. I wasn't just late to class. My craft needed a little work. And Alfredo, uh, well, he worked with me on that. But perhaps most grateful to Alan Samuels for teaching me how to think. And how to think like a designer. You know, Alan used to say, any profession can benefit from the way design and, and creative people think. And at the time, I didn't really realize how right he was. The advice now smacks of brilliance. Design thinking is the hottest thing going right now in magazines, in business, in boardrooms. But people don't really understand design thinking and have many, many different definitions of it. I'll show you the one I learned here, which I, I use to this day, and why that's important. So when you have a problem, most people want to get from A to B, right? They want to solve the problem. Most people think that the least amount of time and the least amount of money you can spend to get from A to B is the best thing that can happen. Now, a lot of you are creatives, and you know that that's absolutely the worst way we can be motivated. In fact, the least amount of time, the least amount of money spent is the least amount of fun. It's the least amount of interest. It's the least amount of creativity we can leverage. But what we have to understand, though, is that most people are motivated this way. In a corporation, that's how you get your bonus or your, your promotion. In schools, getting your homework done fastest, getting the grade, right? Creative people, they don't care so much about how short that window is. They want to get to the same thing, an answer to the problem, but their B looks a little bit different. First thing is when you have the problem, you've got to push back on it. Does this thing really need to exist in the first place? Are we solving the right problem? Uh, is this brief you gave me the right one, Bob? Right? Creative people can be a real pain in the butt. You know, they don't just assume that you've defined the problem in the way it should be. Designers push back on what has to happen. And then they go wide. How many, how many kinds of answers can we get? How many potential answers? You know, I teach at Northwestern, and uh, I teach design thinking to a group mostly of engineers. When they understand that there's more than one right answer to a problem, for them, for most of them, for some of them, it's an epiphany. But there are many, many ways to get to an answer. And designers take those solutions and down-select into some ideas that we then prototype. And those prototype solutions are then explored in abundance once again. And then the right answers come down. And somewhere in between, it's not quite this clean, right? There's a lot of messiness, and maybe we've got to loop back around here. And you might ask why I do this, and I'll tell you. Because this B isn't just the first B. It isn't just a good answer to a problem. It's the very best possible answer. It's the answer the world needs. The world doesn't need a whole lot of more sort of mid-level products that sort of do the, pro the, 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 you know, fix the problem in a sort of OK way. You know, when we do research and 70% of people like something, 
kinda, you know, oh, that's, that's okay, it'll do. That's a huge failure to me. When 30% of people hate it, but 30% of people love it and have to have it, that's when we've tapped into an emotion. That's when we get the real need. That's what this process allows us to do. That's how we get to a B that's important. It's not just the creativity, it's not just the design thinking. There's an element of risk taking that has to come along with this as well. So let me talk to that and then I'm gonna give you a framework. Um, this is a picture of the fellow I was going to see when Monroe uh, gave me her drawing. Do you know who that is? Who? Bob. That's a really clever answer. <laughs> Michael Dell, all right. It's not Bob, it's Michael. In fact, that's what they call him. He goes by one name, Michael. In fact, when I went down to see him, it was um, about, to say, about eight or nine years ago, Michael Dell was worth $17 billion. Billion, the man. I, I found out later they did a background check on me uh, to have me go down there. But he was getting his, his um, hiney kicked uh, by Apple. In fact, he really wanted to understand why Apple products were so much better than Dell products at the time. So he invited six people who did work for him down to come talk to him. And um, we all came in the night before. And the two people who brought us down, Ken and Steve, they were really um, interesting guys. We went to dinner. And Steve was like the guy, a little bit like that guy from the movie Stripes. He's, you know, that guy that says, touch my stuff, I'll kill you. I don't know if you remember that movie. But he was like, you know, you ask Michael for work, we'll kill you. you say the wrong thing in front of Michael, we'll kill you. What was the name of that guy? Harry? Yeah, Harry said the wrong thing in front of Michael, got fired. You know, so the six of us are having dinner with these two guys, and we're like, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. So the next day we go into a conference room, and Michael Dell walks in. And he says, hi, how are you? And he's, he, looks just like, he looks just like that. It's his blue shirt I just wanted. It was so beautiful. Handsome guy. He sits down, and he puts the people around him on a table. And I got to sit all the way around. So he started with the, with the person to his left. And he says, uh, so happy you're here. It's really great. How can, I, uh, how can I compete with Apple? How can I make better products? And this guy starts talking. And when you're in front of a Michael Dell, right, the things magnify a little bit. So he's, he's like, uh, bah, 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 bah. people don't really know, sir, how great your products really are. And, uh, oh, your stuff is just misunderstood. It's really actually very good. And he, bah, 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 and he starts yapping. You know, he starts this yabba, 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 yabba. And Michael goes to the guy next to him. And he says, okay, thank you. How, how about you? What should I do? And this guy's like, yabba, 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 yabba. By the time he gets to the third guy, I can't hear what the guy is saying. It's just noise, you know? It's just like gray noise. It's just like yabba, 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 yabba. So I'm there at the end. I'm thinking to myself, Mark, 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 you've got to do something here. You've got to do something. What's the next piece of this? The next piece of this is taking a risk, right? I'm not, this guy's not going to hear me. I'm the last guy. Everybody's yabba, 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 yabba. So I'm thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Michael Dell is like the biggest University of Texas fan in the world. And I'm from Michigan, right? Like, how, can, how can I work this? How can I work with this? Michigan's in the Rose Bowl against Texas this year. Remember Vince Young? We got our butts kicked. But I can use this. I'm thinking, I can use this. I can use this. So finally he gets to me and he says, Mark. What do you think I should do? <laughs> and I said, Michael, you don't connect emotionally with your customer. So he nods his head and he says, how do I do that? And I look him right in the eye and I said, for me, Michael, it would be if I could put a big University of Michigan logo right on the back of my laptop. And the room goes quiet. 
And I hear Ken say to Steve, he just say that to Michael. <laughs> and Michael Dell looks at me, and you know what he says? He says, so what I hear, Mark, is you like coming in second place. I was down there, and it was part of a CIO conference. And the next morning, we were at the Four Seasons in Austin. They had those big 12-round tables, and Michael was going to talk to um, people on the stage. And um, uh, I had broken through. He and I made eye contact, and we talked. And, um, but I stayed for the, the morning, and I was getting breakfast. And the Four Seasons has this huge breakfast room, and I sat down next to this German fellow at this big 12 round. It was just the two of us. And at just that moment, the doors to the, where the swimming pool was, they, they opened up and Michael Dell walked through and it was morning, so the sun was behind his head. <laughs> and, and I sat down next to this German fellow and he's, uh, he's like, why are you here? And I said, um, uh, uh, well, I came down to talk to Michael. He says, ah, it's not true. I've been coming to this for 13 years. I've never even seen Michael Dell. And at that moment, Michael Dell looks across the room, and he sees me, and he goes like this. He goes, and he comes walking over. And he pulls up a chair, and he sits down next to me. The German guy picks up his thing, and he goes like this. <laughs> I talked to Michael for about another hour and a half. I really got through to him at some level. We all did. I'm not going to take credit for Dell's um, products getting better. A lot of people were involved in that. But, um, but I was really happy to have taken that risk. You know, whether, whether it failed or whether it worked, I was going to do it. Just an interesting footnote. About four months later, I'm in my living room, and I open the paper. And you can get whatever college team you want on the back of your computer, <laughs> except the University of Michigan. Couldn't do it. It designed a bunch of products that took a risk. This is a computer I imagined in 1998. Still provocative today. What if your computer could sit by the window? What if they could absorb light? What if it acted as a, a, as a base station, a homing station for other devices? What if they all came together and downloaded and talked to one another? What if these beautiful leaves that you pulled off actually opened up and projected a desktop? What if you interrupted those pixels with a stylist? Um, that was a pretty magnificent thing. It got the cover of magazines, got the, the firm attention, got us noticed. But I'm going to tell you another story very quickly about courage. And it's a small thing. Maybe it will seem like a small thing in the greater scheme of things. But to me, it's not. It's really big. I was on the Real Beauty campaign for Dove for about nine years. And there was a moment in which I was asked to design a body wash bottle. You know, um, Europeans all use body wash. They don't use soap bars. And Dove wanted to get into that, and North America has come across. Now we all use um, some combination of the two. So this woman, Marianne Amari, she, she uh, brings us all together, cross-functional team, and she says, um, Honest Beauty is the core of our brand. And first, this bottle must be absolutely beautiful. So I took that to heart, and I, I worked really hard, and I worked with the team, and we collaborated in a cross-functional way. I came to this design. It might be hard for some of you up front, but for those in the back, you can see that there is a moisture droplet that's sculpted into the bottle itself. It's not a brand koozie, but in the world of bottles that have to run on a line at 300 or 350 per minute, the idea that the bottle itself is a metaphor for what it does, that moisture is emulated in the form itself, is a really big deal. And many of the people on the team judged it to be a beautiful answer. So, it had a problem, though. Everything else in the category, including the bottle we were replacing, had a flat head. Can anybody guess why it has a flat head? Yeah. So you can, 
you can stand it up in the shower and get the very last drop out of it. So what a dilemma. Uh, Marianne brings the team together and she says, uh, which bottle should we make? And she looks me straight in the eye and I said, you don't have a choice. And the research guy goes, no, 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 hang on a second. See those bottles over there with the flatheads? 93.6% of the people we studied say that a flathead is a key to success in this category. Without it, you're not going to blah, 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 blah. And then she looks at me. And without hesitation, I look at her and I said, first, you asked for it to be beautiful. I believe that research to be true, but not nearly as important as us making this bottle. And she said, and she saw the passion in my eyes, we shall do that then. We shall do that. They have made 900 million of these bottles. I've walked into clients who have handed me this bottle and said, could you do something like this? I usually say, well, yes, I could. <laughs> if you believe in what you believe in, if you believe in your art, then others will as well. There are a lot of rules in, in the work that um, you have to do. Whether you're an artist, whether you're a sculptor, whether you're a designer, whether your rules are corporate rules or business rules, rules that society has brought together for us to, um, to agree upon are important. Some of them are like, well, you've got to collaborate all the time. Or don't just execute from the heart, strategy is, is too important. Um, or evangelize, you know, you've got to be a charismatic leader, you've got to lead your team and, and bring them out there. None of these are true. They're just the way it used to be. I'm not saying don't collaborate, but there are no statues in Central Park that are erected to honor the work of committees. You've got to be strong at some point. You've got to understand that, that somebody wants you to say what it is you say in that moment, that you know how better than them, that your how is the important thing. Strategy is important, but I'll tell you what, the products, the artwork that you create, it's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. Words don't matter as much as the experience that we have with a product. That's what defines a brand. That's what leaves the impression in our mind of whether that thing has value, whether it met a true need. And evangelize? Nothing could be further from the truth. A lot of artists and designers are introverted. Introversion means you think carefully about something. Introversion is a way to bring great content to a really hard issue. Introverted leadership is not an oxymoron. It helps if you're something of an orchestra conductor, if you can enable virtuosos around you, like I suppose I enabled Marianne Amarich to make those 900 million bottles happen. But even if it doesn't, courage will get you through. And like Marianne, or Michael Dell, I suppose. From your passion, they will draw courage. And whether or not you can move the needle, they'll help you move the needle. Now quickly, if we think about creativity and risk as being two components that can't be separated, next for me comes a point of view. And for all the young designers who are out there, let me tell you, I've seen a thousand portfolios just in the last 10 years. Come with a point of view. Figure out a structure, some kind of a framework. What's important to you? It's more important in many ways than the executions or the skills that you display. Um, as design thinkers, we're inspired, thriving, creative individuals who bring passions to the work we do. We're always seeking to do outstanding work and we're proud that we create a better world. As creatives, we employ emotional intelligence to make a difference along three dimensions. We express a unique voice, we solve challenges of cost and delivery, and we connect 
people to ideas and offerings. So we're individuals who are thriving, inspired, intelligent, and emotional. And we express, solve, and connect. You know, when you think about expression, what you give, what you emote, what your, your work says is the way that happens. When you think about solving, whether it's the issue of how can I make a casting this large, or whether it's the issue of manufacturing something in great volume, that's the tool that you employ. You figure out some way to solve. And when you figure out whether anybody's going to be interested in what I'm doing, or whether it's just for me, and as an industrial designer, how many people, how many lives you can affect, that's when you connect. So a philosophy that takes those tools, takes those actions and ladders them up is really important. The, the next thing, and this is a really important piece of advice, if you will, is I found all three of them have to meet. That's when you get to work that's really meaningful when it's expressive, when it really solves, when it really connects. What you wind up doing is you ladder up to an ideal, a better ideal, an ideal of beauty. Or you get people inspired in a way where they say, wow, that's just, that's just ingenious. Or you connect in a way where your creation has true charisma. People are drawn to it. It's got warmth and power. That's what defines charisma. So if you were to ask me, I would say my work is all about the superlative outcome of expression embodied in beauty. And it causes extreme emotional engagement in the physical and the aesthetic attractiveness of a product. Beauty's born there, like in the harmony of that. I would say when it comes to ingenuity, that the emotional engagement that results when something complex looks like pure elegance, right? It's so simple. And it's, a, a, you know, your iPhone, great example. Or charisma, when emotional engagement comes from products that behave in a bold way, a way you've never seen before, a way you've never thought they could be. Wow, isn't that the fantastic part of the how, right? If you can take the why and the how and bring them together this way, You've really got something. Which brings me to the what. So at Lunar, I'm privileged to work with a, a lot of amazing creatives. And they're all inspired uh, and generally happy people. And they all have their own muse, and they all have their instincts. They're artists. They're craftsmen. They're engineers sometimes. We have. 12 engineers on our staff, and about 20 contract engineers working with us right now. And we're all inspired by those ideals of beauty, ingenuity, and charisma. So we got the idea to think about health and wellness. And we thought of the object that health and wellness ladders down to. If you ever get a problem that seems ethereal, but it's an important problem to solve, it can always come back to an artifact. I want you to all picture in your mind an exercise bike. What's wrong with that? Usually the metaphor is of a bike that moves, right? Usually it's a bunch of pipes and things welded together. Um, usually it's designed for a gym in that environment. It's careless in most of the design. There are these clunky things uh, sticking off of it, screens and such. So we designed an exercise bike that looks something like this. It has a tensile structure that supports a flywheel, allows the flywheel to be positioned so that anybody of any size can use the bike. And it projects a user interface. It's made completely of carbon fiber. And it's detailed and designed in a way where even in the smallest environment in Tokyo, in an apartment in Europe, you, uh, you can leave it out. And it's embedded with an aesthetic that actually encourages you to leave it out, right? And while you're riding on the bike, your hands touch 
the handlebars, and your body temp and everything is monitored, and it's sending signals. In addition, let me show you how the bike works. So the projected UI begins, you start cycling. You can calculate your warm-up zone, or because it's a digital interface, you could race somebody. In fact, you could race somebody a world away. The environment around the bike is built so that this interface can crawl up the wall. The potential to project a cycle through Yellowstone or some other environment is easy to do. The object itself actually creates a better experience in many ways, even though it's stationary. And I would argue it's beauty. This ingenuity results in the kind of, well, I'd like to have one of those charisma that we, that we strive to, to get to. You can clap. It's cool. Our, our German office at Lunar will appreciate that a great deal. In fact, just to show you as design athletes, as creatives who are at one of the finest universities in the world, at one of the greatest art schools, I, I believe that dearly. And your prowess, your skills can go from, from something like that, you know, the envisioning of our future interaction with, with products with user interface, to something as simple as this. This is a sink stopper. This is what we call water stopping water. So why can't a sink stopper a humble little thermoplastic resin be the moment when a droplet hits, and why can't that moment be captured in a beautiful way? And when it is, do you, do you take something from the mundane to people wanting to have it? You know, it's important to do work at a very, very high level, but as I began, it's also important to do important work. In many of the places around the world, medical care isn't available. If you got hit by one of these cars in India um, and you had trauma, things could go really, really bad. Now here, you might be rushed to the U of M Medical Center and some room that costs $200,000, uh, you know, well, actually the room probably costs $2 million, but some piece of equipment that costs $200,000 would um, tap into your bone marrow, you know, who knew? But in your bone marrow, when you have trauma, you can read and administer fluid, right? But on a, on a road in India where that doesn't exist or in the countryside, um, you can't do that. $200,000 is an unheard of sum. Um, there are no hospitals. So we worked together with the Stanford Biolab and we tapped into an opportunity. We, um, we used Ingenuity from New England this is a mechanism called the Yankee drill. And back before there were machine tools, they made cabinets, you know, with this mechanism. And we adapted that mechanism into a product. And as crazy as this sounds, you can, in a, tra a trauma situation, you can go into a bone, you can tap into marrow, you can insert a cannula, and then you can give fluid. And that is all about ingenuity that already existed and adapting it and then bringing this, these ideals into the product itself. I'm not exactly sure what the price of that is, but it's about $25, I think. It's important to do work that embodies your philosophy. And again, for the young designers, that's really what I wanna see. I wanna see great work, but I wanna see your philosophy expressed in that. This is the first generation of a light bulb that we did, it's called Switch. Now, what's special about this light bulb? This light bulb will last five times longer than the one you have at home right now. 
five times longer. A light bulb usually lasts around 25 years. So what we're talking about, or excuse me, about five years. So we're talking about 25 years worth of life. And in addition to that, it uses three quarter of the energy to get there. Now when Switch first came out, hotels would buy it. It started at like $50 a bulb. It's down to 40 or somewhere. It's going down. We, we hope to see it in the $15 range soon as volumes increase. But think about it. One light bulb, 25 years, three quarters of the energy, and then multiply that around the use occasion. Listen, I've had your attention for a long while, and I, I really appreciate it. I was showing you some work here that embodies that philosophy and the way uh, that I like to think and the way Lunar likes to think. This is the second generation of the switch. We didn't think the first generation really laddered up expression till it got to beauty, but we think maybe this one did. It's really important because you can take this thinking that I've, I've talked to you about, this philosophy that we've shared, and you can apply it to pretty much everything, and you should. And there shouldn't be compromise. You know, Charles Eames once famously said, I don't ever remember accepting compromise, but I've always gladly accepted constraint. And in our world, there is everything that needs to be redesigned. Nothing is good enough as it sits right now. Everything has to have a new view. And how you do it? How you do it is you take the creativity you're learning here and your individual motivation and you bring the, the creativity and the courage together around a point of view. And if you do that, I guarantee you'll achieve the reward, whatever, whatever that is for you, however that's defined helping societies, helping people, helping business. And if you do those things, then you'll understand the why. The why is so we can leave our kids a better world. Thank you very much. Go Blue.